Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to Bro Man Podcast, episode 139 with Jason Bishkoff, director of licensing and I believe uh, strategic acquisitions or something like that at uh, at Funko Pop. Sure, I was trying to, I'm just trying to perfectly remember your LinkedIn uh, your profile. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, here, I'll put on my formal bow tie for a second. Oh, here we go. I'm director of license, global licensing and global business licensing. development. That's it. <laughs> global licensing and business development at Funko Pop. Um, so I guess my first question is I, everybody knows what like about Funko Pop now. Like it's sure. huge. The first time I encountered it was like, God, I don't even know. It feels like it's been around for a long time. Like I'd always see it at PAX. Um, so my first question is when did you join up with, with Funko Pop? Like, oh, that's a great question. Um, well, first and foremost, thank you for having me. That's oh, super yeah. cool of you. I'm, I'm stoked <laughs> to be here. Um, and you know, I, I love that we're going to be able to engage and just kind of have this rad discussion today. So thank you for that. Um, so I'm going to dive in. Yeah. Uh, I, I will say that, um, I started here at Funko about two years ago, formally, um, informally, seven, eight years ago, um, I was at Blizzard at the time um, and actually signed one of the first uh, then licenses to Funko, uh, oh, which cool. was World of Warcraft. So it, it feels like it was a million years ago. Um, in reality, it was still kind of in the budding days of it evolving as kind of a collectible unto itself. But yeah, um, I've, I've had a lot of contact with Funko through the years. I'm just formally here about two years now. Two years. So, um, oh man, I just realized that I, I jacked up my capture really quick. Hang on. Uh, no problem. that's just me. Everybody's watching the video. It's like, wow, that's a really cool image of OBS. Um, Should I pretend to freeze frame. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, so two years ago is actually really interesting because like that, that means you probably joined up right before, uh, the old global meltdown and, and everybody going inside. Uh, but that's yeah. been for the collectible space. That's actually been really interesting and advantageous. So like as, as an economic mechanism throughout quarantine, a lot of people have seen like, or at least I've been paying attention, like everything that is collectible has been skyrocketing in value. Like people are really started collecting Pokemon cards at a greater rate, you know, baseball cards, all these these things from my childhood that are that are sort of, you know, now they're like, oh, well, I have to have that, you know, up to God. I mean, I'm trying to remember even like an original Mario NES cart getting sold for like yeah. almost a million dollars after getting graded or maybe it was like one point two. So like that, that's the collectible space is something that I've always been around my whole life. Um, how has the increased amount of attention on collectibles over, I guess, the past two years, your time here has that. How has that changed the way that Funko Pop's been like approaching things or how has that informed your approach? Oh, sure. I mean, there's a, that's a multifaceted question. Yeah, right? take so as like, long as you need. It's a big it's a big question. You no, know, it, it, It's good. Um, so you're absolutely right. There is there's an environmental factor that changed in many respects the nature of our business or if anything, compressed um, pieces and then opened other kinds of opportunities. So um, first and foremost, I'll just kind of blanket say it uh and, and I, I take off my funko hat for a second um funko's done a lot of good and a lot of right in its short history right the company's mm. like 25 years old or so yeah um and when pop first came out i mean they did a really good job very quickly of accelerating the volume of licenses that they had access to establishing those studio relationships sophisticating the form factor getting it into as many hands as possible and then more than anything, um, to your point of, of collectability, like really making it a collection of collectibles. They weren't just infinitely produced toys that anybody had access to at all times, right? There was yeah. a chase value there um, that was baked into the nature of the product that has gone on to serve it indefinitely. So that's great. What, 20, um, what 2020 ultimately did is it forced us, I think, in my opinion, it forced us to um, really uh, double down in some respects. Like people have never wanted to collect our stuff more. Um, and uh, there's never been more cool stuff to collect in general. Like the studio, the studios are actually producing volumes of content now. Yeah. That just not, and, and on platforms that just not, did not exist two years ago. Um, so we have you know, 
we have these huge and broad stretching licenses to tackle all that cool stuff that's coming in that's capturing people's attention, but it's also capturing a wider audience because they're stuck at home and it's kind of poking the nostalgia bear because they can't go outside and engage with people in a different yeah. way, you know? So there's a, there's a slurry of factors here that have gone into it. What it's, what it's produced in two years time is um, just new levels of engagement for us. Um, and to your point, like people double or tripling down on this idea of it really being a collection of collectibles. Um, you know, there have been, there have been to some extent um, availability issues because of that demand. Um, but you know, these things are all being addressed in real time and we're dialing in towards the issue. Really at the end of the day, what it means is we're doing something right. We're doing it in a way that's very highly engaging to people. We're doing the stuff that, they, that matters most to them that has real emotional resonance. And we're trying to, you know, deliver it in the coolest possible form factor so that we can just, you know, continue to keep people hype and, and engaged um, with what we're doing and ultimately with what our studio partners are doing. So kind of, yeah, I know there's a lot in that stew there. No, but. that's, that's, that's excellent. Um, so, so what I, what I'm hearing is like, and you brought up such an incredible point, right? You already have all of these partners. And so as they have, have pivoted to this new delivery system of all their content, right? Like yeah. in 2019, Disney was not doing launch movies on Disney plus like that probably yeah. wasn't even in Disney's pocketbook yet. Like the, you know, it could be, I think it surprised everybody. That's why it took so long into the pandemic when everyone's like, why are movies going to theaters? Like I have Disney plus at home. Why can't I get it? So it, it really changed things. And, and the volume game increased at the same time. Right. Especially yeah. now. Um, I think a lot of studios were moving into more, especially with the most recent round of like NVIDIA production tools and things like that, you can do so much with AI that if you're doing animated content, which a lot of your partners do, you can churn that out at an incredible rate. So, yeah. so trying to keep pace with that, that's gotta be difficult. It can, I mean, it can be the, the other thing I think that we all just take for granted is the idea that like franchises are a thing, you know, frankly speaking, five years ago, we didn't think about franchises in the way that we think about them today. Um, and everything is a franchise now, right? So um, I, 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 that's probably a whole topic for another day. But what I'm going to say here is like, there is this huge interest from a cultural perspective in the idea of these baked worlds being regularly explored at different angles, right? Yes. And we have, we have seen, um, we have seen, sort of the Hollywood studio machine step away from the idea of a traditional franchise as just feature film and then subsequent sequels and moving into kind of this dynamic model of feature film, feature television. There's a publishing component or an interactive component. And I'm yeah. very grateful to say that I've, I've, I've actually sat on some of these teams as, as we've been composing those kinds of elements and thinking about franchises and kind of these 360 construct, but that's just a roundabout way of saying that there's never been more content and mm -hmm. there's never been more diversity of content. And on top of the idea that everybody's trying to create this, these franchise worlds, you know, yeah. like um, I am old enough to remember a time where all of us were combing the internet for that sense of community and connectivity around a thing that we loved right. well before that was established and even a profitable medium, you know, like, uh, I'll, I'll kind of choose something out of the ether here, but like for a time you'd have to comb Reddit to find like, oh, all the big ghost heads that were really into Ghostbusters, the first two films and, right. and, and the animated series and then extreme Ghostbusters from the nineties. And that was it. That's all you had. Franchise was nothing more than just like people in a, in a Reddit thread kind of sharing the things that they loved or, or finding new ways to express that love. Right. Right. Now it's so much more formalized more stuff to choose from worlds completely being reinvented. I mean, look at something like, uh, you know, star Wars and the Mandalorian, right? Yeah. Mandalorian completely reinvented the game for star Wars. And it, it sort of reinvented the, the lens by which they are going to do a lot of storytelling. So uh, I know I'm down the rabbit hole here, Ben, but like, no, it's great. 
<laughs> it, it's a lot. It, there, there's a lot of stuff to chase. And yeah. the reason why there's a lot of stuff to chase is because there's new ways to tell these stories. And in some instances, the audience is a part of that story. So people are really like they're invested. Right. Yeah. And of course, when they're invested, that means they want to see and display that emotional resonance elsewhere and outside of their minds. That's where things like collectibles can come into play, because for, without having to watch a show, you can look at a, a pop on the shelf and be like, hmm feels you know yeah um, and, and that's very valuable to us both from like the people that are maintaining franchises to us ultimately selling consumer products around characters that we really care about that's you know i i really do appreciate how because i was curious about how this part of the conversation would go um i was going to ask you directly about like selection criteria but it's sort of really obvious that you you're you're pulling from so many different locations to try and put together a, a con, an endpoint consumer product that's going, that's trying to encapsulate this entire universe, right? Like if you're going to make a Mando product, it needs to be contextualized down to like really fine details to really give it that. And that's something that Funko Pop, I think has always done really well. Anytime I've ever gotten something from you, I'm, I'm not like, uh, not a hyper observant person. So like anytime I get a Funko Pop, I'm like, Oh, it's so cool. So cool. And I'll show it off on stream and somebody will be like, oh, did you look at the inside of the right of the of the wrist? And you'll notice that they have this specific design from like whatever that lets you know X, Y and Z about. The, and I was like, wow, like so taking something from a massive universe and then and then turning it into like a hyper specific product that's really going to nod to the fandom of the entire franchise is like it's a heady uh, it's a heady problem to solve. Sure. And I guess I would just say it in the most simplest of ways, which is like Funko's mantra is everyone's a fan of something. Um, mm. And the reality is everyone inside is also equally a fan of something or some things. Right. So yeah. it's really, you know, it's fans making product for fans. Like we legitimately care, um, you know, tip to tail here on doesn't matter if you are the finance guy or the licensing guy or you know, the product development gal or whomever it might be. Um, everybody is really passionate, really cares about these things. And we are as protective in many cases as our licensors. And mm. so of course, like authenticity is key to what really makes our stuff so compelling um, because we want to put it on our shelf as much as you do. Uh, and that, <laughs> that's really what gets us out of bed every day. So what, so, so yeah, when it, when it comes to working with these massive, uh, IPs that, that you all partner with, because I mean, it's, I think throughout my experience as a, as a content creator and a fan of media, it seems that at this point there isn't a, a space where Funko isn't creating something, uh, yeah. for you to pick up, whether that's movies, music, games, uh, television shows, like all of it. So what is, what is it like trying to work with some of these larger partners? Is it like, do you get an order sheet? I'm sure everybody's super interested. Like, are they like, does, you know, does, does like, you know, Walt Disney send you a personal letter that's like, I would like to create, you know, this many Star Wars Funko Pops or sure. like, as I'm super fascinated about that process. Sure. So if you can share, if you can, I mean, can. I can share, I can share a little bit, which is that um, some of it is driven by, you know, what's in the content. Um, if there are two characters or 20 characters, that makes a difference. Mm. Um, some of it is driven by retail demand. Um, some of it is driven by fan demand. Um, you know, it's kind of a coalescence of a number of factors. But really, at the end of the day, if people are excited and they're picking this stuff up um, and there's momentum there, then, of course, we're going to continue to chase it and do more. Um, mm. And sometimes we test it and, 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 and it takes a while to ramp up. And sometimes we just go out the gate with a whole heavy offering of, of goodies. Um, but I think we're just trying to be conscious of like, really, at the end of the day, sure, it's great to program, you know, what can we produce versus, you know, how much, um, how sensitive do we have to be on the on the part of our our um, our fans and how much they have to spend this month or whatever. Mm. I mean, all those things come into play. But really, at the end of the day, it's about um, cool factor, right? Yeah. Um, what, what is the ultimate achievement of cool factor? And if we can answer that uh, at the end of the of every day, I think we've done we've done the job. So. So when it comes to making something cool, is there like a standard procedure for you all? You're like, mm, this is neat, but how do I make it cool? Yeah, uh, there's definitely a, a process, right? 
Right. And a lot of that starts at, at the st strategic level. Um, and then in many respects, it, it comes through the incredible lens of our creative folks. Um, we do it, of course, all in partnership with our studio friends. So yeah. I want to be clear that like every single pop or any product that we're ultimately producing, it's done by a very select committee of influencers and, and um, they can be a, a broad diversity of folks across, you know, multiple disciplines. At the end of the day, everybody just wants to come at, come at this with a goal of, um, you know, what, what is the best possible execution or what's the thing that really geeks us out? That's a, that's a right. common question. Um, so, you know, we, we just try to do the brand service. We try to do ourselves right and do our fans mm -hmm. right. Um, I, I know it's a bit abstract, but the, the, the reality is, is it's incredible creative people yeah. working with other incredible creative people and then ta-da, babies are born. <laughs> I mean, it's it's abstract. It's art, right? Like you have to deal right. with you, you take the big, weird, hefty concept and turn it into a thing. And yeah. that's that process is always really hard to describe. Uh, yeah. You know, it's hard to it's hard to nail that down. I'm uh, so what I was hearing there and what I think super interesting is that you mentioned that you're always working hand in hand with your studio partners. So every yeah. product's kind of a collaborative effort. Um, what is it like, I, I guess? on what level are you collaborating? Is it like you're going to get creative from the studio and a creative from Funko Pop and get them in a room together and have them talk? Uh, or is sure. it, or is it like, uh, you know, you sit down and it's like a board meeting, like, Oh, it can't be, you know, those pants are the, that's not the right, you know, <laughs> that's not the right, uh, whatever RGB color red. So like, it's not, no, like what, what is that like? The answer is yes. Ah, <laughs> so, you know what I mean by that is, yes. Um, I've worked at other companies. Um, I've worked on the licensor end of the spectrum. I've worked on the licensee end of the spectrum. Funko is by definition, usually the licensee in those relationships. Um, but the answer is yes. Like there are standing meetings every week. And when we are so privileged to do so, we throw ourselves in a room and have a brainstorm or just a side conversation. Um, and then sometimes it becomes a tactical, like what is the Pantone color of Mando's pants, you know, like, right. <laughs> um, it, because that stuff's important and that's brand integrity, but really, uh, it, it's it, the answer is yes. It's all of these things. It's a very long relationship to create any one given product. Um, some companies, it takes 12, 14, 18 months to produce something from scratch. We work, we wow. work historically a little faster. Um, but, you know, we're always trying to get in a, into a more advanced cycle. But I, I will say that one of the things that I truly love about working here is just how, how dynamic we can be and how quick we can um, we can react to something. That's I was going to ask you about about timelines on stuff, because in so today, like with consumer products and everything being like really fast um, or people getting especially now with digital collectibles becoming something at the forefront. Right. Yeah. Um, it is it's really interesting to be working on a longer timeline against something like that. Uh, yeah. What you know, and I think that you're, you know, the brand history that you have. What I love about Funko Pop, I wanted to I didn't want to interrupt you earlier. But what I love <laughs> about Funko was, you know, for me, it's always been something I like most of my life. I was like, oh, that's cute. That's cute. That's neat. Neat. Right. And then, uh, you know but you work with so many things. And then I, I think it was uh game of Thrones stuff. You launched like that. And I was like, Oh, I got to buy all of it. Like, you know, <laughs> I was so, I was so caught up in that fandom that I wanted that like physical anchor in my home. And so I, I, it's really interesting that you're, you're bringing things to market that are unique in uh, uh, like a, <clears throat> A marketplace of immediate satisfaction you know sure. so what what is it i guess when you're looking towards the future how is funko pop or how have you started looking at the digital collectible space sure good question so um you know i spent almost a decade at a video game company and i can tell you it's very different the life cycle of creating product for a video game as a patch or as dlc or whatever i mean Literally, you could be reactive in a matter of hours, uh, right. nonetheless, weeks or months, unless you're creating something whole cloth, which, you know, a game, especially like a AAA title, can take a couple of years of development, if not more. Yeah. Um, it's a bit different on the consumer products end of the spectrum, just based on the nature of what you're doing. There's literal 
you are manifesting abstract into physical reality and mm. then having to produce it at a large volume. So it takes months and then it takes months to ship that stuff across the globe. And, yeah, you know, for us, our goal, I think it's just like any good author. If we've done our job, you can't see us, right? Mm. The magical thing that you wanted just appeared on shelf at the time when you wanted it most. Mm. Um, that, that's our goal, right? That you right. cannot see the gears for the machine. Um, and I think we do a damn good job of it. Uh, oh, totally. That that being said, you know, digital is different. It's digital. Uh, it, it's different for um, for for the nature of our business because we've done only so much of it selectively, um, and we're constantly trying to be on the bleeding edge of of kind of what it means to collect. So, you know, these days we're looking at everything. Um, you know, there are initiatives like Funko Pop Blitz, which is our mobile game. That have really kind of challenged us from an art art development and pipeline support standpoint to like how do we feed five new digital pops into that game every mm. week uh, every week and do that in partnership with our friends at network um and there are other initiatives too like digital pop which gave me um, heart palpitations we, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the oh, project yeah, yeah, you yeah. just described like consistently updating a game with five things every per week, single week from cor with corporate partners and I like all your consider so you got like Disney considerations, you have all the game considerations, oh, yeah. music and everything. And now you want to put them inside of another environment. Yeah. How does, hey, what's yeah, that, I I, what's well, that I, like I, managing that? Do you have like constant stress, <laughs> constant stress? The, the reality is on that particular title, we've got it dialed in networks. Awesome. We're leveraging uh, a lot of existing creative, which really helps in the in the overall process, but it you know it is a lot of heavy lifting. It is mm. a lot of work, but uh, my hope is that it's it's worth it to those folks that are just excited about playing as their favorite characters in our pop stylization in a game that really matters to them, right? Oh yeah. Um, so there's nothing like playing directly, as your favorite like, character. What's that? I said there's nothing like playing as your favorite character. Oh, nothing like when the when the game launched, for example. Um, uh, you know, I'm a huge Back to the Future fan. So the idea that I could drop Marty into the into the puzzle board, use his super, see the DeLorean break into frame, leave the flame trails and bur burn the board heads off the table. It's just like, I don't know. It's that it's that it's that sticky. It's that thing inside of you that just uh, is tickled pink to not only see the character in action, but to some extent have uh, have agency over their actions, you know, like. That, that's just cool right yeah. so to answer your question like uh i don't know it's complicated like we're, ju we're just trying to do the coolest possible stuff in the newest and most interesting avenues and ensure that we are doing so and delivering with a degree of again here's the key word authenticity to us and authenticity to our partners mm. and provided it's, it, it's authentic and people feel like they have a platform to participate i think again job well done right yeah that is that is fascinating. So you met, so you mentioned in there about, you know, coming from the gaming space where you have really quick turnaround to resolve things. And now yeah. you're here where like production time pipeline is way different. Was yeah. that a difficult adaptation for you? Like as a person to go from being able to quick respond, uh, let me, uh, here's my example when, sure. you know, I'm used to streaming, right. And I run all my social media and so when we started doing, um, you know, consulting at Rare Drop to, to help bring people into the space and all the different charities that we're now working with and things like that, um, helping with social media plans was part of that. Uh, yeah. And so I'm used to just being like, let's do this. And then everybody I'm working with is is highly competent, right? Like in the streaming space, everybody is their own director, an audio engineer, network engineer, social media manager, like, you know, you do everything. Uh, so I had this faulty assumption that, Oh, it's easy. And so folks will come to me and they'll be like, oh, we want to set this this media marketing plan. I was like, awesome. It'll only take like two weeks because like yeah. I'm thinking, it, you know, if I sit down with all my streamer friends and we wanted to set out a year of marketing for ourselves, two weeks would be more than enough time. Um, yeah. you, know, you sit down, you get the game calendar, right? Like you can you can lay it out. It's simple. Um, you know, I almost gave our, our now COO uh, uh, Mindy a uh, panic attack <laughs> because she <laughs> she's from the traditional marketing space and understood those timelines. And so part of part of what I've been learning, um, you know, from her as as we've grown as a company is like, I need to take a step back and understand traditional timelines. So, yeah, sure. like that was that was my experience. 
So I'm super fascinated what what it was like for you. Okay. I'm going to go backwards to front. So on Perfect. that specifically, I would challenge you to sure learn about the traditional, but stick to your guns. Like the things that make you that made you successful, like oh, yeah. don't shed those things in favor of falling into a norm schedule. Mm. Um, because I would argue that many of the good folks, your audience included are coming to you because of the speed at which you are producing totally. at the level at which you are producing it. Right. Yeah. Um, don't burn yourself out by any means, brother. But, <laughs> yeah. um, but like, that's part of the magic of what makes you, you, I would argue. Um, yeah. In terms of, you know, uh, for my transition, I mean, I, I'm kind of a professional weirdo. I'm just going to kind of put that out there. Um, I've had the great privilege of being in the, in the licensing entertainment consumer goods space, the better part of like 16, 17 years. I started at Playmates Toys working on Ninja Turtles um, as a consumer product uh did that for three years which was like a, a dream come true and then i made the transition into video games but even then i was working on like the physical product component for as much as there were some digital components that were still a part of it um oh, and did man. that for almost you know did that for almost a decade and then you know jumped to power rangers for three years uh, and then now i'm here at funko for two yeah so the answer is like th there's always been some degree of a quote unquote, traditional manufacturing backbone or through line through many of these positions. It's just been, what's the expression of, of the needs of the day um, in and on top of that, that sort of ever present column of a, uh, of, of throughput. That is, that's awesome. So you're just, you were just like, I'm ready for a new challenge. Like I'm ready to look at yeah. things differently. It's, and like, it's just like, um, it's same tools, different day, right? Um, and, and that's really what it, what it boils down to is in every position I've held, um, you know, I'm, I, I'm just very grateful to say that, like, you kind of learn as you go, you build up your tools, um, and then hopefully you approach each and every day, uh, with enough humility to think that the tools you have couldn't be improved. Right. <laughs> um, yes. so that, that's really kind of been my story, my professional story thus far, but it, like, look, it, it comes with a lot of appreciation for what everybody else's pipeline looks like, right? Yeah. A big part of what I'm able to do now is because I know and can respect what a digital pipeline is versus a physical pipeline. Right. And what's, what's the best overlap of those two streams? Um, so I don't know. It's strategic. It's um, it, it's broken every day. And hopefully you've got good <laughs> enough tools that you can put it back together again. Yeah, that is putting out putting out the fires and yeah. all that stuff. So I got I got a to shift gears. What sure. what do you look for when you're out there looking for something new? Like let's say that there is, you know, an IP or something that's out there that you haven't brought into your network yet. Yeah. What yeah, sort yeah. of things are you looking for? What what represents a strong IP? that you think, oh, okay, well, this is somebody we should merchandise with and we should we should work on licensing things. Sure. I think anybody in licensing would arguably say that would, would arguably say that um, it comes down to, or I would argue, hopefully, mm -hmm. uh, if you're in licensing, you're doing it because you really care, like you're really resonant with something. Mm. Um, for us, that tends to be one of the biggest uh, North Stars in what we're chasing. I, I don't want to create any sort of illusion that I make any sort of decisions exclusively. Oh, there are, yeah. There's entire Part communities of, of people internally that are that we're regularly polling for, you know, what makes sense or what we should be going after. Um, I'm very grateful to say top to bottom, everybody's a fan. And, mm. and again, just to kind of double down on that sentiment, all the time we get uh, notes from our CEO or our president or our CCO about like, hey, I fell into this over the weekend. It's the coolest thing I've ever seen or mm. heard. Um, clearly there's a lot of people talking about it. Let's just kind of explore it. Does it make sense for us? Yeah. So it comes from all directions. Um, and I think generally speaking more than anything else, we're looking for stuff that really connects for people. Um, and I know that's a little like, maybe that's a little hippy dippy, but it's, I think what it's meant to say is, is that like, if people care, um, and we just have to kind of use the litmus test of, would they care enough to see that thing uh, on their desk every day, in their kitchens, in their office? Mm. Um, that's the first and foremost question, right? So it, it turns into, so it's the consumer endpoint, right? It's, is this yeah. something that's valuable enough to like 
pick up desk desk space, something like that. Well, yeah, and let me be clear: like we're we're constantly casting our nets, and equally mm -hmm. so, we get petitioned all the time for uh, us to look at other people's stuff. I was going to my next question. And, you know, I will tell you that ninety five percent of the time, it's a no. Um, right. So everybody has great product, but that doesn't mean it's going to make it's going to equally make good product for us or through us. Right. Mm, yeah. Um, so it, it's a bit complicated, but uh, really more than anything else is, are we fans first and foremost? That's a good first test. Yeah. I like that. So going along that route with yeah. uh, the rise of the content creator and the digital influencer and, you know, however people want to define the other part of my job, uh, what, how does that play into all this? Is there, you know, I've I've seen some attempts to do similar style products of yeah. where, you know, you're trying to turn influencers into a little collectible device or item. What do you think about that whole process? Like, where do you think that could go in the future? Professor Roman, uh, Professor Roman, are you pitching me right now? And I'm not. A, a I am pop? not. I know that I don't have a big enough community to try and get a Funko Pop, but I mean, like, there's, you know, like there, there's people out there who who can command more attention than entire franchises of movies, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So That's I'm, tricky. I'm curious. Yeah. How does, how does one approach that? Yeah. I mean, it's a question I think that we're answering regularly every day. Um, I would say that you're absolutely right. More people, at this moment in time, more people are engaged with um, individuals and perceiving them as brands than ever before, right? Yeah. Um, and in many respects, you develop that kind of emotional resonance with a person or group, and it really matters to you, right? Like, I'll give you a good example. My wife and I are huge Try Guys fans. Um, okay. And we've been following them for years and we we listen to the podcasts and we watch, you know, twice weekly or whatever. We bought the book, you know, like um, we're into it. So to your point, like, yeah, big parts of society are being motivated by these individuals. And I think you'd be foolish not to ask the question, is this valuable? Is it resonant enough that we, we should start having a conversation around consumer products? I will tell you that like, I don't know if there's a definitive answer here. It really comes down to what's the temperature of the day. Um, and we've only done, at least from a Funko perspective, we've only done this selectively. Um, and I, I don't know how to answer it other than to simply say that like, it is a thing, but I don't know if it's as mature as we need it to be just yet to be a more prevalent part of our overall portfolio. That makes, I mean, that makes a lot of sense, right? That's the... And this is the this is the thing, right? And this is what I'm discovering a lot with gaming and and influencers and and everything that's evolving is that there is this massive growing economy behind yeah. you know creators and attention and individuals as brands, which I love the way that you put that, right? Like, you know, random Joe Schmo on Twitter that ends up with you know maybe they maybe they end up with a hundred thousand followers just because they tweet memes, right? Like that individual. Sure is going to naturally seek out, oh, like, well, I should get some branding done. I should do all this other stuff. A decade ago, maybe maybe that would still happen. But like 20 years ago, no way a normal, <laughs> no way a normal motherfucker walking around is going to be like, oh, <laughs> uh, you know what? I got a lot of attention. Let me let me get a logo and sell some shirts and all this other stuff. Like the 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 default business acumen of like, I got my shot now. What do I do? That's yeah. that's there. Like that's in place. Um, I think for me, one of the things that I've been unlearning after being in, in industry and in content creation for so long is that every industry has its like necessary titration period where it's like yeah. we it is we are too too risk averse to engage in, you know, producing a whole bunch of products for uh, uh, an, an economic space that's like 10 years old and unproven. Sure. Um because it takes, uh, and I, I love that we had so much discussion before this, there is so much machinery to move <clears throat> yeah, to get one thing on a shelf. Um, and, you know, you're dealing with legal and everything else, like all the way top to bottom, and then to, to grab 
an individual as, as big or small as their business might be. And then just say like, we're going to produce a whole bunch of stuff behind this. When you have no, you have no idea if that individual streamer is just going to drop off the face of the planet in the next year. Sure. Uh, so uh, there's I, that. I, I'm going to kind of piggyback off what you're, what you're saying here a little bit. So I think what I've observed as a fan and individual, this is, this new media space, um, which even by a term is kind of antiquated, but go at with this, me. Yeah, at this right? point, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but like this space specifically is so fascinating to me because it is, um, I mean this in the adjective way, not in the literal way, it is twitchy, right? Like it's so impulse driven. It's so driven by the moment and your relationship yeah. with an individual in a very specific space. And to me, in the abstract, it takes a lot to ask the the digital fan the follower it takes a lot to ask them to log out of their computer get into their car drive to the store search for a thing on a shelf pick up that widget come home and put it on display like or wear it or whatever it makes so much more sense to me if you minimize the amount of clicks from i want a thing to i have the thing if it lives natively in the space in which you are most resonant and you are most most prevalent that feels more native as a transaction like literally and figuratively yeah and so i think like the future for me um as, as best as i can kind of discern it and read the tea leaves here the future for me for con like consumer products around content creators is literally in the space in which they occupy and and are most comfortable right mm. um like i i don't know if i would go to um to Target or Hot Topic to pick up a Hot Ones t-shirt. Um, right. But I would I would probably buy it instantly online if I saw it and it was right there at my fingertips, right? Yeah. Um, and so it's just a question of like, how does that dynamism work when, I, when I'm engaging with you in this way? Like, how, what is the definition of that, that, that dynamic such that like you can leverage it as a brand um, because that excitement is valuable. Uh, right. And again, I'm a bit down the rabbit hole here, but like I, there, there's something no, this really is fascinating. This is exactly why people, this is exactly why people listen to the podcast. Keep, yeah. Go as far down the rabbit hole as you want. All right. All right. <laughs> um, yeah. But that, that, that's really what I mean. It's just like, look, you live in this space. People want to engage with you in this space. Um, and I think here, you should I'm be sorry. building. I have a dog. <laughs> you're good. You're good. My dog really quick. I just, you're, to you're totally fine. I can still you're hear totally you. Fine. <laughs> but I think people just want, they're here for you now in this space specifically. So if you're building a plan or you're building a strategy, in my opinion, it should be in, in which the house you've already built, um, you know, dogs yeah. or otherwise, but in the yeah, digital yeah, yeah. house in which you built, right? Like that is the, that, that is the shortest possible connection between you and everybody out there that's engaging with you is literally this space. So how do you leverage this space? Yeah, so <laughs> you met you brought up so much stuff there. <clears throat> I got totally distracted. <laughs> it's fine, my bad. You're, fine. you're good. Um so I think that you're right, right? There's there's so much room for growth in the creator space and there's a lot of I mean, we're still seeing it now. Like there's a lot of um <clears throat> unresolved conflicts right and i don't mean like there's problems it's more that uh there are like legal rules or understandings that haven't been reached between like as a yeah. standard operating agreement right like if you were to go to a business to business meeting with a potential new you know ip you want to work with there's a standard operating procedure based off of like are they you know this type of franchise i assume like are they a game are they a movie is it an individual ip something like that but if it's an influencer if it's somebody who's just got like a massive online following I, like the rules in many places haven't been written for those kind of relationships yet yeah. and so you're talking about taking on something that's relatively high risk and then you're talking about writing the playbook <laughs> and then and that's that's uh, one of the things i've learned like looking at larger companies like that's tenuous because if you if you write the playbook it exists and anyone can use it, right? It doesn't, yeah. you know, like you can NDA it to death, but like the first time, like all it takes is one person 
emailing one thing and then now everybody has like oh this is this is it like this is how we work with influencers this is how we move all this stuff forward and so everybody i i feel like sometimes there's hold back because it's like we don't want to be the first people to do it like we want someone else who might be smarter than us to figure it out or yep. you know and then depending on how the executives are making decisions it's like we might want to watch somebody else crash and burn on this you know like we don't want to because there's a whole lot to win if you get there first, but there's so much to lose if you show up over invest and it blows up and disappears. So like I, this is like, for me, this is really fun because it's like an affirmation of everything I've been learning since I started streaming in like 2013, right? Like yeah. I, and that's a long time. That is, that is a, <laughs> that is a, that's an eon in terms oh, of, yeah this market and this angle specifically yeah i'm right? i feel ancient <laughs> <laughs> you're not i, I you're know not. but on but that's the thing right like there the it's like the warp right like if you yeah. go if, if on twitch um you know uh <laughs> flopping back and forth between like traditional business and and doing content creation it is it is mind-numbing sometimes because it is like uh, you're working on a timeline that's like five months out here and that's fast. And then, yeah. you know, I, I step into another role and I'm like, oh, if I can't get this done tomorrow, I might as well not do it because it's not fast enough. Yep. Uh, and so you're you're just constantly dealing with the like this variable acceleration and talking this out is helping me realize why like a lot of people <laughs> kind of stay away. They're like. <laughs> Oh, these people like they're doing great. They're making money. That's awesome. But like, have you heard them talk about their job? <laughs> like they're, they sure. don't even, I mean, and that's the other, I think that's another huge part of it is that a lot of what we're doing on, on our end, creating content, there's no playbook for that either. There's no, no there, there aren't uh, I, when I first started streaming, uh, I like to talk about it or content creation, like, um, <clears throat> like a traditional union. Like I was, I was born and raised in like St. Louis. My dad is from Chicago. So like, you know, I was around union types of, of jobs my whole life. And, you know, it takes 10 years to become a journeyman and it takes, sure. you know, 15 years and all these tests to become, uh, you know, uh, whatever, or I think it was 20 or 25 to become like a master plumber. Right. Yep. But once you're there, like you've attained that skill, like this space hasn't even lived long enough. Like it's just been around long enough that there are enough journeyman level, you know, uh, union members to sort of like start this process of defining the shape of what this this whole thing is. Right. There isn't, a, you know, like there isn't a there isn't like a. A, a round table of everyone who's been doing this for 50 years and who who've had like proven strong careers that are all diverse. Like this guy played sports games. This guy did RPGs and this guy was variety and they've all been crushingly successful. And so when they sit down and talk, we should listen right, right. now. It's everybody just being like, I think I'm right. <laughs> and, and yeah. the market's still figuring it out. Okay. So, wow. So much to unpack. Um, oh, I love it. Great. I'm, I'm going to rewind a little bit to a little bit earlier in the conversation where you were talking about the differential between being on the bleeding edge and then having to sustain and, and feed kind of like um, a, a, tr a more traditional channel. So you're absolutely right. right. I think you've identified something that is our practical everyday and reality, um, which is all of the spaces, all of the retail spaces, even in some cases, the, the e-commerce platforms. All of these spaces primarily are defined by like the least common denominator. The thing that we are all aware of, like you're going to go to Target or you're going to go to Amazon for the most part, and you're going to go into these spaces looking for the brands that you know, right? right. And, and they stock those things, whatever they are, widgets or shirts or whatever, they stock those things based on a general assumption that they need to have, they need to have like enough of the basic stuff that everybody's looking for in order to be a sustained business, right? Yeah. So they are driven by the idea of kind of a, a traditional play, least common denominator men mentality, the stuff that is biggest and most resonant from a franchise perspective. That can be literally a franchise, like a franchise world, mm. or it can be like the vacuum cleaner brand that most people know, right? Yeah. They, are, they are driven by this idea to be, the most general thing to the broadest number of people. 
but right. also they have an appetite to be or to find or to generate the next big thing so mm. that that can add brand equity to them and it could kind of capture a whole audience that's never maybe even been in a like a target or on amazon or whatever it is yeah so th this is this weird space of like how do you throttle that line as bringing in the stuff that everybody is expecting but also trying to like innovate and be something new or deliver something new and that, that's where that liminal space is literally where like our business lives it, it i mean it's almost every business i've ever been a part of and to your point the magic is how do you write a playbook that works within yeah. those defined spaces and then has other elements that help complement and, and bring it all together as kind of one chorus um so further still to your point, as you're talking about people that live in your speciality, like people that live in this, it, it's a, it's a, uh, a wild frontier of, um, of streaming, right? Or even just content creation in general. For me, it's very interesting because uh, when I was in school, uh, I minored in anthropology. And mm -hmm. one, of, one of the most prevalent ideas in anthropology is this idea of job specialization. You've got you've got enough like general resource in a society that people don't have to be a doctor. They can literally be a generalist and a brain surgeon and a gastronomical expert. And right. like, you know, like you have strata of expertise and with, and with each expertise, there's a higher level of um, value that the, the culture places on that person. Right. Yeah. So I think that's what's happening in the content creation space. The reality is, YouTube or whatever, or Twitch, like these are, these are agnostic. They do not care about what is being featured, unfortunately, right? True. What they care what they care about is that people are engaged and people are arguably most engaged when they find like the thing that is most specialized to their interests. Yeah. So it's not just about like Butube. They're literally looking for a Butube influencer that's really dialed into RuPaul's Drag Race and is exploring mm -hmm. like whatever it is, you know? Yeah. Um, and to your point, like people have had to create brands unto themselves within within this space in order to stand out. You can't just be like generic person in a in a tuxedo, you know, yeah. like you you have to be known for your personality. You have to you have to understand the brand at which you are producing at your content level. So like, dude, there is there is so much baked into this, but you're you're absolutely right in saying that it is being rewritten every single day. Everybody's got a different approach. And fascinating to me is this juxtaposition of traditional infrastructure and high value targets that are on yeah. the bleeding edge. And where do you find that convergence between those two audiences? That's alchemy. And there's there's so much value to be found there, but few people can do it well. Yeah, that's, I mean, <laughs> that's what we've been trying to do at GCX every year, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, and it's it's building an event like that for out of nothing and then trying to get people to buy in <laughs> to it and, and things like that. It is, it is, uh, it, it really is like we have rewritten how that event runs on the back end, especially for creators pretty yeah. much every year because um because I'm in tune and and uh Tim Darkness 429's in tune with the space Kevin was super in tune cuz he used to stream all the time but like we're there every day so if we see something come up or something's being talked about you know like when you're talking shop right uh with other broadcasters you know oh well, like this is a predictive need like if we yeah. approach them as an event with these things already solved for them um they will they'll more than likely they'll want to attend and also it'll increase the joy of their experience there you yeah. know so so for us we we always have like the front facing thing with gcx where we really want to engage people we want to sell tickets obviously we want to raise money for saint jude but the thing that a lot of folks don't see is that we we desperately try to help figure out the other side of the equation what is it like to bring in what is it like to responsibly bring in four to 500 content creators and give them the value that they're seeking out of the event in a programmatic yeah. programmatic way, because there's no way we could do white glove service for everybody, even though sure. I personally wish we could. Um, but there's time constraints. And so figuring that out, that has evolved every year and it has made, you know, it's always made our head spin. <laughs> and because, well, because there isn't, there isn't a playbook. Yeah. 
And well, uh, so um, I know it's a bit, again, it's kind of like, uh, it's a bit antiquated to simply mention it, but like once upon a time, I remember when Penny Arcade was like a bi-weekly comic that people just kind of went to a web page of yeah. all things, like a dedicated web page. And I remember them literally uh, blogging for uh, for the first time, like, hey, we're thinking of doing a meetup in the Seattle area, yeah. right? And they probably went into it with similar goals, which is like, hey, you guys really care. We really care about you. We think we can do something a little bit different in person that we can't do through this one medium. And so they took a risk and they they built a community that now has become kind of a staple of the video game space, which is, yeah. you know, PAX, right? And there, you know, there's a PAX East and a PAX West. So what you're doing is just, it's fascinating to me and it's good work, um, not only for what you've got going on on the back end, which is critical. Like the idea that you were supporting, sustaining elements of St. Jude's, like kudos and God bless you for doing it, right? Um, and the fact that you are doing the good work of community building and enabling people um, in the best possible way and trying to save them a little bit of time and rough road that you've had to travel, like... I, I don't know, man. It, it gets a bit spiritual and philosophical, but the, I, but you know, I constantly use this uh, th this analogy of like I am just a fellow pilgrim on the road, and uh, and it seems like you know you are doing um, you're kind of doing the Lord's work here, so to speak, um, of being a fellow good steward and pilgrim on the road, right? That is that. I mean, no, that's totally how I feel. Uh, but that, that's, that's my, uh, that is my way. Right. I, I had a bit of a rough go of most of my life. And I always told myself, if I ever do anything, no one else has ever done. I'm not going to be the asshole that just like walks up the side of the mountain, doesn't like drop flags, um, yeah. on the way up. And because the only way to move a space forward is to recognize when you're a trailblazer and to yeah. accept grudgingly or otherwise that you're now you're a leader tough shit um and because yeah. that's i think that is something um from the content creation side i think it's something that everybody accepts now um yeah. is that if you have a large channel you're a community leader but when i got started that was a debate people were having this debate of like so what if i have three million followers like doesn't matter what I say, like, I'm just a guy and I'm whatever the hell. And like, I don't have a community. Like, these are just people yeah. who want. And so there were these discussions about even even the aspect of leadership associated with with growing along with these, as you stated, agnostic platforms that really just want to grab attention. Yeah. Um, so bringing bringing all of that together into what we do at GCX has it always has me intrigued about how other people do that kind of creation you know well and i'm gonna i'm gonna piggyback off that because if i can draw from my own experience again i'm a, I'm a professional weirdo the kinds of things that i've been been able to see say you know touch <laughs> engage with like if i were to tell my seven-year-old me the things that i get to do on a daily basis little jason's head would literally explode right yeah and uh, and I'm and I have to like kind of drill this home. I am exceptionally grateful to be able to do what I'm doing, and I'm very grateful for every step that's taken me to this moment in time. Those steps did not happen independently. It always came as a product of knowing somebody or somebody who was gracious enough to extend a hand or an opportunity. And so I am right there with you. I absolutely subscribe to this idea that um, uh, I certainly didn't get here on my own. And I have a responsibility um, in many respects to extend that same hand in all directions because that's the, that's the only way we ever get anywhere, right? Is yeah. like, if you try to think about it in a bit more in, in, a, in an abstract way, I am literally shaking hands, kind of going up, hopefully up through a chain of individuals that have lasted through you know, their careers and or through history. So it is equally yeah. my responsibility to extend my hand backwards, forwards in whatever direction I can to pull people with me because that's the only way anybody ever really ever gets anywhere. Yeah. So again, kudos to you because it seems like, you know, you've grappled with this idea, this philosophy of um, I've been given ergo, I have to give. Yeah. And I think that that is, uh, it seems like you're employing that philosophy in the right way. So Thank you. I, again, like God bless you, dude. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. That's, that, that's, uh, that's, 
I'm bad at taking compliments. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm <laughs> working, take compliments. Yeah, no, I'm I'm working really hard not to try and negate compliments immediately. Um, that's like something we're working on with my therapist. <laughs> you know, she's like, you know that when you do that, like people are like, oh, I don't know. Just take the compliment. I'm like, yeah, okay, yeah. fine. Okay. That's how she always hooks me. She's like, but what would they think? And I'm like, oh, damn it. I got away sure, from it, sure. and then now I have to come back. And I was like, "Yes, of course." <laughs> now I'm still doing what I want. Yeah, it's great. Like, you, you know, therapy's fun. Uh, would, it be, would it help if I tipped in the chat? Is that, is that a better way? Of- <laughs> that oh my god, <laughs> that still makes me uncomfortable after a decade. Somebody sure. comes in, they tip like a dollar, and they're like, "Hey man," oh, well now it's like it's like, "Hey man, I started watching you when I just got into high school, and now I'm graduating yep. college." Yep. And I'm like, yep. I was not ready to have an existential crisis at like 1030 in the morning. Yeah. Uh, but but that's like that's the way things have grown. So um, we're we're coming up on our time here. Uh, and this has been an absolutely phenomenal uh, conversation. So I'm going to I'm going to ask you this. If you could give um, a piece of advice to somebody who is you know, let's say looking for a career in like the merchandising space or who sure. might know about your career path. And that's why they're, they're tuning in. Um, do you have any advice for somebody who might be starting their journey uh, sometime soon? Yeah. So absolutely. It's the same advice that was given to me in high school. Um, and I've been pretty consistent about repeating this as often as I can. Um, so if you want to get into entertainment, consumer products, actual content production, whatever it is, um, really you have to imagine like your goal as the center of a target. Um, And you need to start throwing bolts against that target. What I mean by that is you you have to work your way center. You cannot expect to just shoot bullseye. Does it happen? Sure, it happens. But those people are entirely the exception to the rule. What I would instead encourage you to do is Think about where it is you want to go and find any way to to break into the overall industry. It doesn't matter what it is you're doing. Just break into the industry and constantly refine your game and work your way center. Um, that That's how you get closer and closer in a very realistic and practical way. So let me be straight. If you want to work in the entertainment space and you are currently engaged at like, and I do not mean to belittle this by any means whatsoever, but if you are working at Enterprise Rent-A-Car, that <clears throat> the the applicable experience between enterprise rent a car and being a production assistant somewhere else, while it may seem like it makes sense on paper, it does not necessarily make sense to the person that's going to be looking for that person, right? That so, is very fair. That is very fair and good so advice. You have to start. You have to start low. You have to say yes a lot. You have to refine that aim and game and work your way center. That's my general advice. I. That was, uh, was beautifully defined. Um, I think that that I mean, that matches the story of so many people who who I've had on and who I've had a chance to talk to at various events where it's like I used to be a forum moderator. And then I then they one day they were like, do you want to do part time community management? We'll pay you. We're thinking about making this a field. And that, and then they're the full time, you know, for Triple A Studio. And I've yep. I've heard that story so many times. And so there, you know, right now there are so many places in my mind that are like being a forum manager, you know, whether sure. that is being a knowledge specialist on TikTok and talking really in a really educated way about your specific franchise. And then you get, you know, like, again, like I <laughs> from from working with all the organizations we do. If you can speak articulately about games, gaming, and the social medias attached to it, if you can just do that, you have absolutely no idea how much that would blow everyone else's resumes out of the water. Yeah, like, 100%. Um, I, I've, I've spoken about this on stream before, but I, I fundamentally believe that pretty much every vertical uh, or style of company is eventually going to need a, a gaming specialist on their team yep. and i don't care if you're enterprise rent a car or if you're target or if you're like uh you know a national grocery chain yep. somebody is going to be in that fortune 500 company in maybe even the executive boardroom saying this is how we are getting our products in front of the gaming industry yeah um 
and and that's happening. And so just like you said, if if your goal is to get into that boardroom, working adjacently to like just getting involved in gaming, creating specialized content and building a community around it, showing that you can, you know, manage that kind of energy and prove yourself to be an effective communicator about it, it will go so far uh, for you. Infinitely so. And if I can add one small addendum to Absolutely. that, there's really only two ways. Um, what, once you've found yourself on, on ground floor, there's only two ways. You can either build up or claw uh, or, or tear down, right? Right. And okay. I would I would highly encourage you, if you're watching today, regardless of what it is that you do, regardless of where you want to go, um, I would argue favor lawful good, go for build up um, because tear down comes with consequences that you may not appreciate today, right? Like yeah. if you are an industry that is requiring you to build bridges and you're in the business of burning them, good luck. Um, but build up, build up is my my general uh, advice. I, What a beautiful note to end on. Uh, <laughs> th thank you so much uh, for joining me today. Uh, I, I, absolutely loved our conversation this is probably one of the most insightful business conversations every i say this every time we have some a, a business professional from like a different vertical on um but this was this was phenomenal i learned a lot i appreciated your insights uh if you are are listening or if you're watching this later live um thank you so much if you uh, do anything please share this with somebody who it made you know, if you thought of somebody when you were listening to this please share it with them you can review or any of the other stuff if you want uh, but you know, I want to get this knowledge to the people who need to hear it. Uh, make sure to check out the rest of the rare drop roster of podcasts as well. This is something I've done a bad job of doing, uh, in the past. So here, check it out. You can go to rare drop. We have, we have star Wars and scotch. It's coming out. They have like a whole bunch of special episodes next week. Uh, we got the WTF podcast coming back and, uh, we, you know, we have studio blank for all of you anime nerds. So whatever you want to listen to. We've got it. And now you can't avoid the bumper. I got you. Uh, thank you so much for listening. And we'll talk to you next time. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everyone.